Well, good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Richard McSpadden. Uh, I'm with the AOPA Air Safety Institute. Been there about four years, I guess, uh, now. And uh, delighted to be there, delighted to be with you here at Sun and Fun. We have an interesting conversation this morning. We have uh, the chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, the Honorable Robert L. Sumwalt III. He's gonna join us, but due to pandemic restrictions and, um, and other requirements, he's gonna join us via uh, satellite, via remote link here. You can see him on the screen here in just a little bit. I wanna just tell you a little bit about uh, Chairman Sumwalt. We're fortunate to have him as the chairman of the NTSB. He's got an extensive background in aviation. He flew uh, for Piedmont Airlines and then U.S. Airways for about 30 years or so. And in his work in both those airlines, he was involved in safety operations for both of them. He ran the flight department for a, a, a Fortune 500 uh, corporation. He's uh, a graduate of the University of South Carolina. He's got a graduate degree from Embry-Riddle and uh, he's an inductee into the South Carolina Aviation Hall of Fame. So I'm delighted to work with him, uh, proud that uh, he is uh, representing the NTSB and he's been on the board, I think he's been a board member for some 15 years now. So Chairman Sumwalt, are you there? Can you hear us? Richard, good afternoon, it's great to, uh, great to see you. Yeah, great to see you, thank you for joining us. Uh, we all wish we weren't here having fun in the sun and back in our office uh, in DC like you are. Oh boy, I tell you what, I would love to be down there with, with you all. And uh, are you having uh, a lot of sun and a lot of fun down there? I think the weather is good down there. Yeah, it is good. We've had great weather and I think I think all the above. And, and the attendance here is good too. So yeah, it's been a really good show so far. Well, um, thank you for joining us, uh, Mr. Chairman. So um, why don't we just get started with, the, speaking of the pandemic, um, how has the NTSB been working during the pandemic? Are you still going out on investigations? What's, what's the tenor like there at NTSB? Yeah, great question. We are going on, uh, on accident launches when we can. Right now on aviation, we're doing about 72% of the accidents that we would typically launch on. We are going to those. We just, uh, on a Marine accident, we just sent the vice chairman and a team this morning to Louisiana for a Marine accident that happened a uh, day before yesterday in, uh, in um, uh, south of uh, New Orleans. So we, we are staying busy. I can give you some facts and figures about what we are doing and what we have done. Be glad to do that if you like. It looks like you're still working remote because that looks like you're home in South Carolina. Is that right? So are you guys still operating remotely? We are, um, we are operating remotely. You're right, I am in South Carolina. I look forward to getting back into the uh, office. I've had uh, both of my vaccines now, so I look forward to getting back. Officially, the, the government is on max telework. We've been amazingly um, productive for the last 13 months while we have been in telework. Uh, but uh, but I, think we, I think we all look forward to getting back uh, to what what used to be normal. Yeah, I, I would agree with it. So can we start a little bit before we get into uh, some, uh, some of the more serious topics of the NTSB, can you share with the audience here a little bit about your aviation background? I mentioned a little bit in the introduction, but can you tell us uh, how did you get your start in aviation? Where did your uh, origin come from? Well, Richard, uh, you've heard this story, so I hate to tell it again, but not everybody's heard it. I, I say I got into aviation by accident, and uh, and that's the truth. When I was a senior in high school, I heard on my car radio that there was uh, uh, had been a plane crash out by the local airport, uh, and I thought, wow, that'd be interesting to go see. And so I figured out how to get there. Uh, when the coroner, I pulled in right behind the coroner. When he got out of his car, I decided just just tuck in close to him, act like you know what you're doing. And and actually, that's a pretty good lesson in life, act act like you know what you're doing. When they raised the yellow tape uh, for the coroner to duck under, uh, I ducked in with him. And there I was on the scene of a fatal King Air crash. And um, and it, it uh, unfortunately claimed the lives of, uh, of, of a few people. Um, I thought a lot about that crash. And a few weeks later, I took a friend out to show him where the plane had crashed. And Richard, this is the part that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you were 17, it may, but looking back on it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. After you go see where people died in a plane crash, why naturally, 
Where do you go? Well, you ride by the airport, stop into a local flight school, and sign up for flying lessons. So that's how I got started. I literally got started into aviation by accident. Hmm. And you came up through general av aviation. You went through the airlines, a long career with the airlines. When you transitioned over the NTSB, what would you say your, your major takeaway from your time with the airlines and in safety with the airlines? What's some of the major takeaways you brought with you into your role in NTSB? Well, I had always been reading NTSB accident reports ever since I was in college. So I, I pretty much knew how the board operated. Um, I, um, and then I did a lot of safety work at the airline. So I was familiar with the board. And so there wasn't a huge transition in terms of trying to understand the mission of the agency. It was just like, like going into any new organization, learning that you have to fill out a, an SF-182 for training requirements or you know things like that. But, but philosophically, I feel like I had a good understanding of what the agency did and how we go about doing our jobs. Hmm, nice. Um, the board itself uh, is made up of five board members, right? And you have very unique and specific uh, roles that are, that are sometimes somewhat limited. So do you mind sharing with us just the NTSB makeup, like who does what over there? Yeah, so there's, as you mentioned, there's a board of five presidentially appointed Senate-confirmed board members. Uh, and then there's a staff. The staff, we have 400 employees, full-time employees, that truly are the backbone of the agency. They are the investigators. They are the ones who, the chief financial officer's uh, office, the CIO. So all together, uh, we've got a support staff of 400. The board members are, um, we have staggered terms. We, ha we serve five-year uh, five terms, and they're all staggered. My term will expire at the end of this year. I think the vice chairman's term expires at the end of next year, et cetera, and so forth. So um, really, the board members are not there to be specialists. Uh, you know, I might read in the paper if I, if I go out on an accident, uh, the media might say, well, NTSB Chairman Robert Sumwalt is leading the investigation. Well, board members don't lead investigations. We have professional staff, an investigator in charge who does that. So uh, I'd be glad to talk more about what we do. But the bottom line is the board members are there to provide the oversight over the staff's product, that once the investigative staff have completed their product, then they elevate it to the board for our consideration, deliberation, and uh, and, and adoption. And ultimately, it's the board that has to sign off on uh, the uh, recommendations, the, the probable cause, the findings, and the recommendations that come out of those reports. Is that, is that true? You're exactly right. Yep. Okay. Uh, and we're lucky in that five of, uh, of the five board members, I think currently three of them have a general aviation background. Is that right? I would say four, actually, because Tom Chapman, uh, okay. our newest board member, um, has a uh, has a, a private pilot certificate. And the fifth one, uh, Jennifer Homendy, uh, was at one time taking uh, flight lessons just a few months ago. I don't know if she stayed with it during the pandemic, but um, so it's nice for us to know that uh, the NTSB has some background in general aviation, and they're and they're concerned about general aviation. What I've, what I've observed about your investigators are they're really a phenomenal skill set because they're the first to arrive on a scene where there's chaos, as you can imagine, it's completely unstructured, and they have to play part grief counselor, investigator, um, media correspondent, so they're playing a bunch of different roles when they go out on these uh, investigations. I'm so glad you mentioned that because we really do have superb staff at, at the safety board, and they do a, a really good job. And uh, so I'm glad that we can give them a, a shout out. Yeah, I, just, just what they have to do in coordinating with, you know, the, the state offices and county offices and local sheriffs and business owners or private property owners, they've got the family. And then their core job is to figure out what happened in this accident. So I find the skill set of those investigators to be um, pretty impressive. So they're, they're pretty impressive people. Um, how would you say, and sometimes we forget because we're so focused in aviation, how would you say um, 
that other parts of transportation are doing comparatively to aviation in terms of how they look at safety and the progress they've made in safety? Well, you're right. And, and I think this audience uh, does realize that the NTSB investigates all modes of transportation, including pipeline accidents, but not everyone understands that. So um, uh, if you look at the other modes, um, I believe that they there's a lot that they could learn from aviation. And uh, I think that's a real credit to aviation, um, to what improvements have been made in that in that arena. Uh, there is a lot more than that other modes of transportation can do. And you look at the highway mode, I mean, that one, that one is the probably the scariest of all. We've got between 36 and 38, 30, 40,000 people each year die on roadways in America, and that's totally unacceptable. And uh, so there, there's a lot that can be learned from aviation and, and a little bit that can be learned uh, the other way as well. Sure, yeah. Um, recently, you released your 10 most wanted uh, list, which I think you do biannually. Um, can you talk to us about that process and how you determine what goes on that 10 most wanted list? Yeah, it's uh, several maturations, but bottom line is we look, we have a, 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 a waiting tool or a, um, a prioritization tool that we look at the level of validation, how ripe something is for action and, um, and some other uh, parameters. And we try to elevate those issues that have the biggest potential to improve transportation safety over the next few few years. And uh, it's not a perfect science, but we really, uh, we had our board meeting on that Tuesday of a week ago. I think we're very transparent in how those items go on the list. And um, and I think it's a, it, it's a good list. Now, I want to emphasize that even if something is not on the list, it's something that's very important to us. So, but these are, this is where the bulk of our advocacy efforts will occur over the next two years. Yeah. Moving, moving on to speak more specifically about general aviation. Recently, you had a board, ma board meeting, I think it was around March 23rd. Um, and in there, you made some recommendations. I think the report was issued just, the final report was issued just a few days ago where you talk about, uh, among other things, uh, Part 91 revenue generating operations and some of the requirements you wanted for them. Can you talk to us a little bit and share with the audience here, in essence, what that report was about and what you recommended? And, and then we can share that conversation because as, as you and I have spoken, we all, we, both of us want the same goal. Um, sometimes we disagree on how to get there. Yeah. And this was one of the, the uh, very rich conversations we had. So do you mind sharing with them, uh, Mr. Chairman, what that report was all about? Yeah, I don't mind at all. And I appreciate the, the, the dialogue that we, that we do have and um, appreciate that very much. What we looked at is Part 91 flights that actually revenue is uh, revenue passenger carrying Part 91 operations. Now, we generally think of, oh, Part 91, uh, there's no revenue involved in that. But in fact, there there are uh, provisions for Part 91 flights to be revenue flights. Some air tour operations can do that if they're operating within, I think, 25 miles of the origination airport. Uh, the, a couple of them that we looked at would be a, a parachute accident where people are paring, they're paying money to go up in an airplane and parachute out. Revenue is, is occurring there. Uh, B-17 accidents where people pay, the, the one that we had a few years ago, people pay $450 to be able to ride on this historic airplane. And we love going out and seeing the warbirds. But once money is changed, it's exchanged for goods and services, there should be a higher level of, of, uh, of care, a higher standard of care. And so one of the things that I think that we're not exactly aligned with AOPA, AOPA on is the requirement we want there to be safety management systems required for any revenue passenger carrying operation. And again, once, once people start paying for something, 
there is by law, by, by the legal standard, a higher definite and a higher standard of care. And, um, you know, if you want to go out, Richard, and fly in your airplane, you and your son want to go out and fly with your neighbor, uh, that's one thing. But if you were to hang a shingle out and say, we're going to give you an air tour, pay us $25 for your air tour, um, then we feel like there needs to be greater, uh, more stringent requirements for that. We felt like that was a loophole in the regulations. Mm -hmm. And our position from AOPA is that, that re leveling that requirement on all revenue generating operations doesn't fully appreciate in our mind the kinds of revenue generating operations that happen under Part 91, some of them, even under Part 135, some of them are single pilot, single aircraft, and to ask those people to implement an SMS program and then ask the FAA to have oversight over that program, we felt like was too broad and, uh, and too onerous, quite frankly. And I think one of the major uh, areas where sometimes we disagree is that we, we all know that you can make operations safer by regulating them more but you can regulate to the point that it strangles it. And if you, if you look at the airline operations and you look at military where my background is, there's a reason they make those safer. They're professional people, they do it for a living. There's a high level of public risk, risk to the public involved in those operations. They are billion dollar operations that in the airlines carry hundreds of millions of people every year. All that regulation is appropriate to the level of public risk there. We don't think it's appropriate for Part 135 and Part 191 revenue operators because, in essence, you're going to strangle uh, general aviation, and, and that's our concern. Well, it, I, I certainly uh, I hear what you're saying, and thank you for, for that. Um, first of all, SMS is scalable, and that's the important thing. And we feel that, and we do feel like, so you're looking out for the owner of the airplane we're trying to look out for the for the for the traveling public mm -hmm. and and do you agree that if you start the traveling public when they show up and say i want an air tour or i want to go on on a b-17 flight do you feel that they should have a higher level of safety than just you and your son out flying around with your neighbor I do. I also think the, uh, the uh, mechanisms are in place already to ensure a level of safety that's appropriate for the operation. I don't think we should ever try to push it to the safe level of Part 121 operations. And I think we should be honest with the public that it never will reach that level of safety. But I do think that the mechanisms are already in place. And in each one of the accidents that you mentioned, there were existing regulations that were violated or, uh, or, not, or, or where oversight wasn't adequate. So my position is we, all, we, all, we always ought to start there with what exists and do a better job of, of enforcing that before we start tacking on new stuff. Yeah, we looked at, at five accidents in that Part 91 uh, Revenue Passenger Carrying Operations uh, report. And in each of those, uh, people were saying, hey, we're going to charge you flight, in we're going to give you flight instruction, but then they're out uh, doing uh, uh, up uh, upset recovery training, at, or not even training, they're going uh, these warbird experiences where you shoot, at, supposedly shoot at the other airplane and, uh, and thrill, thrill rides. And so, um, you know, our, our report does show that whatever is in place is, is inadequate. And let me ask you this, you're, you're the AOPA's professional safety person, mm -hmm. uh, and you and I have talked about this. Why would you, as a safety person, be arguing for anything for a lower standard in safety? I mean, I can understand where Mark Baker would argue for that, but you're the safety person, uh, Richard, and I've talked to you about this before. Your job is to look out for those people who don't have a voice. You should not be, as the safety person, should not be saying, we feel this. If AOPA wants to say that, that's okay, but you, as the president of, of the Air, Air Safety Institute, should take the, take the position that, you know what, the safety board is right here. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate that you've made that uh, observation to me before. I guess it comes from just a general uh, belief that I have that if you take the approach that 
uh, always safety at, at every turn, do everything possible to make it safer. We all know the secret to that. Just regulate it so much to where you strangle it. And then, and then you'll drive out safety because you'll drive out activity. So as a, as a safety guy, I'm always for practical solutions that work. And part of my concern with the report that you guys put out was that some of what you were advocating was going to be excessive on uh, operators and onerous with very little safety uh, implication involved in my mind because it's, it's not an extensive problem. It's one we'd like to fix. We'd like to drive accidents down, but the mechanisms are in place now to fix it. And adding on new regulation is just going to strangle it with very little safety benefit. So that's well that's on Tuesday. Yeah, and I appreciate that. On Tuesday, we will have a board meeting, or a lot of people call it a hearing, where we will deliberate a mid-air collision that happened around Ketchikan, Alaska. And uh, you're certainly familiar with that. And there were five fatalities, mid-air collision. Um, and we found that if, and, and one of those was a single, uh, a single pilot owned his own beaver, and um, and he was carrying uh, passengers for hire, and um, and then the other was a, was an otter, and uh, carrying uh, a number of passengers. They collided, and five lives were, five lives were lost. We do believe. Uh, I think a point that will likely be made in that report is that had SMS been in place, uh, they could have anticipated certain risk and mitigated those risks. So I would invite you to uh, meet with the families with uh, with me uh, right before that board meeting and uh, and explain your position and see uh, those those passengers deserve the higher level of care. Yeah, I we and they and they and they, and they lost yeah. their lives. Yeah, we agree they do. Um, as I mentioned, I think the mechanisms are in place and part of our success will be to enforce those mechanisms that exist before we tack on uh, new regulations. And uh, both of us agree it's a tragedy. And uh, as you stated in, in one of the exchanges we had, we want the same goal. Sometimes we differ on how to get there and we have a slight difference here. But I want to move on if we can, Mr. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, let me yeah. go ahead. Is there one more? You want to make another comment on that topic? I, I thanks. I appreciate it. I think I've said enough on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the timelines in your investigation. So a while ago, it would take a little over two years to finish an investigation uh, for the NTSB. I know you put efforts in place to reduce that. It's been a focus of yours. Uh, how, can you update us on that progress? What's the average time now for, from the time of a fatal accident until the, uh, until the final report's released? It's it's uh, it's much longer than I'm comfortable uh, it taking, and I'll be honest with you. And so we've put an extended effort on that. Uh, we formed uh, two years ago an ARTP, which is the Accident Report Timeliness Project, uh, and basically we did sort of a lean approach to understand the problems and see where the bottlenecks are. Now. Uh, um, Albert Einstein said that if he had 60 minutes to solve a problem, he would fin spend the first 55 minutes uh, trying to understand the problem and the, the remaining five minutes to solve it. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. Sometimes you can apply the wrong fixes uh, if you don't fully understand the, the, the problem. So we did a very extensive analysis of, of how we were conducting investigations, where the bottlenecks were. And as a result of that, uh, we have for the last year, since March the 1st of last year, uh, in place this ARTP, where there is, uh, uh, there's accountability, there's expectation management in terms of scoping the investigations. And, and I think that that is going to yield us uh, a more effective and efficient investigative process. So um, I never want to rush an investigation. It needs to take as long as it takes. Um, but I think that uh, these investigations, many of which have um, unfortunately taken longer than, than I'm comfortable with them taking. I think, I think the NTSB leads the world in terms of their accident investigations, the quality and the thoroughness of them. Um, we'd certainly like to see the time reduced because the information that comes out of them are so critical. We in the Air Safety Institute use the NTSB reports to develop our NAL report, which is the annual report on GA safety that's used throughout the world and throughout industry 
uh, media and industry and government and everywhere else on, on the safety performance of general aviation. We, after 80% of an, uh, a year's worth of NTSB reports are finished, then we will develop our null report because statistically, we feel like that's enough reports to develop our report. Um, what we've done to try to help reduce that timeline on our end is we've gone to a system where now as soon as the NTSB releases reports, a tranche of reports, we'll ingest them, update the data, and update the null report so it's constantly updated and basically live within 30 days. And by doing that, we've eliminated six months to a year on our end that it took to, uh, to, uh, to analyze these reports and put our, our report together. So uh, we're working with you and trying to do the same thing to get that data lag time down so we can all get the improvements out uh, faster. Yeah, well, I want to commend you and the Air Safety Institute for the good work that you do, not only with the null report, but with the training videos, the safety videos. Those are excellent, and I have uh, used them myself. So thank you for your good work there. And uh, we are working to, like I say, to improve the timeliness of, of our investigation so that you're not having to do uh, the heavy lifting on your end. Yeah, great. Well. Mr. Chairman, I've sort of led this and driven the questions here up to this point. Is there anything you'd like to share with our audience or talk about or questions for the audience here or me? Yeah, thanks so much, Richard. I mean, the, the COVID situation has obviously been devastating. Uh, we went to Max Telework on March the 16th of last year, along with all of the other, uh, most of the other government entities. But we have amazingly been extremely productive in the virtual environment. I'll start out with the investigations. Um, we, granted, for the first nine months or so of the pandemic, we were not going on scene to a lot of accidents. Now, the fact that we don't go on scene does not does not mean that we're not investigating it. We're still gathering. Uh, uh, we're gathering evidence that was collected by by the FAA and local law enforcement uh, officials. We're gathering that evidence from them. We're doing the air traffic control data download. We're getting ADSB data. We're conducting uh, interviews uh, remotely. So we, we're, we've been able to conduct our investigations, uh, but we're not always going on scene. Now, since around the 1st of February, we have launched to I think about 73% of the accidents that we would normally have launched on. So we're starting to, to pick up the pace of that after we've completed a very thorough risk assessment. We're making sure that when we do go, it can be done by, by managing the risk. And um, to give you some examples, um, last year, if you look at May, I'm sorry, look at March of last year to March of this year, and compared with the same period of a year of, of a year earlier, we have completed 354, 350 more aviation reports than we did during the earlier time frame, and uh, and that's about a 30 percent increase of the report output. So the fact that we have not been launching has actually allowed us to start to catch up on the backlog. Uh, we have reduced the total aviation backlog by close to 20 percent. And um, we're still doing follow-up activities. We've done over 150 follow-up activities, like doing engine teardowns and, and uh, things of that nature. Um, we, our, our materials lab, uh, they have, have now the lowest backlog in, uh, that they've had in 12 years. The FOIA Freedom of, Inform Freedom of Information Request uh, backlog is down by 85% back to the level that we had it in 2012. Uh, and we've conducted, uh, as of this coming Tuesday, we will have done 11 virtual board meetings. And again, a board meeting is basically a hearing. We had never done a virtual board meeting before, but we figured it out. And as of now, we've done 10. As of Tuesday, uh, it will be 11 that we will have done in the past 12 months. So uh, to the credit of of our employees, our IT folks, uh, our investigators, uh, we have been very productive during the, the pandemic. Good to hear. Well, um, we've got some audience here, so if anyone in the audience has a question uh, for me or the chairman, there are some microphones in the center, center aisle there. And uh, while people are stepping up there, 
Um, here comes the gentleman now, Mr. Chairman. Sir, do you mind if you state your name, if you don't mind, tell us what you fly and where are you from? Uh, my name is Stuart Fraley. I live in Indianapolis and I fly a Cessna 185. 185. Oh, yeah. awesome. So um, my uh, question is for you, Mr. Chairman, about, um, so I had a friend that died in a home built three or four years ago. And the, when the final, no one came to investigate in person. And uh, the final report, well, all the, everyone who knows the guy thinks that this was probably a VFR into IMC. Because the, the debris field you could cover with a bed, bed sheet, you know. And um, the final report just says loss of control in cruise. So that's going to affect Richard's data, because he's going to call that, in the null report, he's going to call that loss of control, when really it's VFR into IMC, which are not the same thing. So, and you know, nobody tore the engine down, uh, nobody saw anything, you know, about the specifics of this crash. And that's just background. The real question is, how does the board decide which accidents to send people to, which ones to tear down engines from and things like that, versus which ones to just, you know, take the data that are given? Good question. Mr. Chairman, did you hear that? I did. Still okay. a great question. I'm great. sorry for the loss of your of your friend. And um, so really good question. As far as which accidents we will actually go on scene on, um, to, to put it in perspective, uh, there are about about 12 or 1300 GA accidents each year in this country. And so we go to around 225 to 250 of those. Now, there's not a hard and fast rule on this, but generally, if it's fatal, we will we will go. Um, so we, we, we do have limited staff, so we've got to figure out how we can best utilize our resources. And I'm not sure, and you may disagree with this, and if, and if so, that's fine. I'm not sure what marginal safety benefit we're going to get out of uh, somebody running out of fuel and landing in a um, landing in a in a pasture, where at the at the very end of the landing roll they shear off a, a nose gear and uh, it bends the prop and does substantial damage to the to the to the airplane. That would meet our accident definition. What is the marginal safety benefit of going to that? There may be some, but given that we've got so many accidents each year, we do have to. Uh, triage those that we will go to. Now, as far as doing an engine teardown, there again, that's part of what we're trying to do in scoping the investigation. Um, when, when, when the investigators come back, they meet with their supervisor to try and understand what, what are the issues here. If we think that there's an engine failure, uh, certainly we're going to tear, tear down the engine. Uh, but if it is a, a VMC into IFR, that results in loss of control, and I ask this question rhetorically, our investigative staff might feel differently, but do we need absolutely in all cases to do an engine teardown on that? Um, I, I, I defer to the decision of the experts, but I'll contend that we may not need to do uh, a complete engine teardown on every crash. So that's my thoughts there, uh, Stuart, uh, and I hope that that answers at least some of your question. He's nodding yes, Mr. Chairman. He said thank you. Anybody well, else? Well, thank you so much. Anybody else have a question? Dean. Uh, Dean Brown, also coincidentally from Indianapolis. Um, for the record, I am FAA, but I'm asking strictly in a personal capacity. So I'm an air traffic controller who does a lot of research about how to teach controllers to respond to emergencies effectively. I have uh, one request and at least one question. Um, the request is basically for a little more factual information to be released with the accidents. Um, I do a lot of detailed research, a lot of times dig into the public dockets. And one of the uh, gaps in the data that would seem to be easily addressed is winds aloft data, uh, especially for engine failures. I've tried to tease out how well the airplanes are gliding in some cases. And without the winds aloft data, I'm really handicapped. It's very tough to find out. So I, I'm not asking you to commit to this, but with the factual information, it would be nice to get something in the factual data that is akin to what a pilot would get in a pre-flight weather briefing an hour or two before departure, including all of the weather forecasts, um, including the NOTAMs, whether or not the pilot got that so that we can see what, what they got. 
um, that makes it a lot easier. So kind of a request, you can't commit to that, I understand. The specific question is, um, sometimes when I research, I try to get information about docket material from years ago, and right now the answer on some of these older ones is there's a backlog because of COVID. Do you know when that might get addressed and I can get some of these older dockets? Thank you. Yeah, Dean, thank you. I, I think uh, I, I think you, you attended something we did at uh, Oshkosh a few years ago, so it's good to see you again. Um, is, I've taken notes on your, your thoughts about, you know, what else could be in the docket, weather information and things like that, and I've taken a note to that, and I'll feed it back to our staff. Um, now, regarding the docket, uh, we, we have uh, had issues with our docket, and uh, so we formed a, a docket management task force to figure out how we can, uh, uh, we want to make sure we're being consistent in when we, when we release the docket and uh, things like that. So now we have a, a computer tracking system, it's called safety, and uh, that just happens to be the name of it. And so before you can go, before the investigation from step five to step, step six, whatever that means, I think there's eight steps in there. In, in order for you to go from one step to the next, the docket has to be entered, uh, has to be opened publicly. And so we, we've tried to put controls in place that will ensure that the docket is released uh, in a timely fashion. So there again, we realize that we, we can do better and we are trying to do better. Thank you. Looks like we have one more question, Mr. Chairman. Fred Hoopert from Oneida, Tennessee, flying uh, Liberty XL2. Uh, as the chairman of the NTSB, what's your um, opinion or reaction to FAA's apparent reluctance to accept or act on some of your recommendations? Well, I get, I get asked that a lot, and, and let me say this. Uh, the FAA has a hard job. They are the regulator. We're the agency that, that investigates crashes and identifies issues and then comes up with recommendations aimed to correct those deficiencies. The FAA, on the other hand, uh, has to do uh, go through a rulemaking process to enact a rule, and um, and they have to um, perform a cost-benefit analysis. So, uh, as we know, recently there has uh, been a, an anti-regulatory uh, environment in Washington. I think that's uh, probably changing now, but. Um, for every one regulation that the FAA, that any government agency could could implement, um, for any one regulation, they had to pull two off the books, and so that that was creating problems. I'm not here to apologize for the FAA's lack of action. We see things that take too uh, that take too long. I think it's the rulemaking process itself that's broken, and uh, uh, they and and when you think about it, we want to. We as citizens don't want a heavy-handed government. We don't want an overburdensome government. We might argue on where that line is drawn, but we don't want the government shoving a bunch of stuff down our throats. So there needs to be a very deliberate process to make sure that is being whatever is being put in place is a legitimate need. And so I respect the process, but I just think it takes too long and yes, I will say on record, the rulemaking process is somewhat broken right now. Anybody else for me or the chairman? Well, great. It's always enjoyable uh, to talk to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. If you had any kind of last thoughts, a safety message for uh, the pilots in the room here, what might that be? Well. As you know, Richard, there's a, we need to, to get our loss of control crashes down. And uh, there, there's things that can be done. There's technology that can be introduced to help with the loss of control issue. Uh, that is still the leading factor in fatal general aviation accidents today. So I know that you on your working groups, uh, the JG, GAJSC, uh, is, is working on, on solutions for that. If we could drive that down, we'd have a lot better safety record. Now, of course, the safety record has gotten better over the years, but it's somewhat stagnated, and we want to we get it down even lower. 
If I had to just say anything in particular, I would say um, it's what you would do when you were flying with the Thunderbirds. Assess the risk, and if the risks are too high, do something to mitigate those risks. And and I, I think the audience would really like to hear uh, your thoughts on what you did as a Thunderbird, as the lead Thunderbird pilot to, I've heard you speak about, about I think there's four things that you've talked about. Another thing to do is um, use each flight as a learning opportunity. Uh, think about uh, what went right, what went wrong. I'm sure that you and the Thunderbirds had extensive pre-briefs to talk about the risk that you might face, what you can do to mitigate those, but just as importantly, after the flight, uh, what what went right, what didn't go so well, and what can you do differently in the future? As an airline pilot, I tried to do that uh, after each of my, when I'd finish up a trip, and uh, it, I think it helped keep me out of trouble. Richard, uh, any thoughts from you? I think you've got a valuable experience here. I, I share your view that we've driven the accident rate down in general aviation by some 50% over the last 25 years. So we've made great progress. It'll, it'll never be enough, you know, in my mind. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to see it get down to zero. And about 75% of accidents are still pilot error or pilot misjudgment in some case. So as you mentioned, what we really focus on in the Air Safety Institute is we think if you take knowledgeable pilots, you train them well, keep them proficient in reliable equipment, it doesn't have to be the newest equipment, but it needs to be reliable, and you surround them with a culture that helps good decision making, that's how we'll continue driving down the uh, accident rate by focusing across all five of those, all five of those principles. And we do that. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry, please. I'm sorry. Um, we do that in conjunction with, uh, with the NTSB and the FAA. I think the, I think the aviation industry as a whole works together. We certainly have our differences and we'll fight every now and then, but collectively, we've driven the accident rate uh, down by uh, working together and continuing to drive in the problems that we see. Knowledgeable pilots, good training, proficient. I think I missed the fourth one, and, but then it's surrounded by a good, good safety culture. What was the fourth item? Reliable equipment. Yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for that, and it comes from the voice of someone who has vast experience both in uh, high-performance uh, aircraft, leading the uh, Thunderbirds uh, and other military experience, but extensive general aviation experience as well. And as I've said, Richard, I appreciate what you and your colleagues are doing, and uh, let's work together to continue to improve aviation safety. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Chairman, and we look forward to seeing you uh, out when you can be out and about soon. I know you love these events. We typically see you here. We typically see you at Oshkosh. So is there, is there a chance we'll see you at Oshkosh this year? Well, I'm sure hoping to, and I guess uh, the real question is, is, is EEAA going to have it this year? I haven't heard otherwise, and I would sure love to get back and, uh, and be up there with, with everybody. So I, I sure hope so. Yeah, yeah they, they are going to have Oshkosh this year. It will go on. So we're, we're all going to be excited to, to be there. And we we'll hope to see you there. But thanks so much for your time this morning, Mr. Chairman, and hope to see you soon. Be safe. Thanks so much. And I appreciate everybody taking the time out of watching the, the, the exciting stuff uh, to come in and, and participate in our, uh, in our chat uh, today. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>